Hello everybody and welcome to The Surge. My name is Saud Al Zaid and today we'll be talking about ECMO and trauma. Is it completely crazy or is it the way to go? So if you look at the literature in general, uh, there are three big situations in which ECMO has been used in the trauma setting. The first is uh, VV ECMO and bad chest trauma. This started off as a couple of case series, subsequently became bigger and bigger data, and now it's pretty much contemplated in most cases of intractable lung contusions or ARDS. The second is VA ECMO within one or two days of being under hemodynamic compromise in the ICU. Now, th this obviously includes uh, multiple causes. It may include sepsis, post-trauma, um, traumatic cardiac contusions, although I would consider this to be extremely rare, unless there was a valvopathy involved. I might do a, uh, a whole episode on blunt cardiac injury and uh, cardiac contusions. The third is, um, probably the third most common is massive and submassive PEs with hemodynamic compromise. And the third category is uh, emergency ECMO in severe multi-trauma patients while they're in the trauma bay or in the operating room. So just to review it again, first is if you have a primary respiratory problem, extremely bad lung contusions as an example. The second is hemodynamic compromise requiring VA ECMO. And the third is emergency ECMO at the time of arrival or in the operating room. Now, in all three of these cases, the context of the ECMO seems crazy to some people because of three other factors. The first is bleeding risk, because most ECMO circuits require heparin, or at least that's what, what's been argued traditionally, and Poor prognosis, and I put this in quotes in trauma patients, the reality is they're not that poor a prognosis if you try hard enough and you have a dedicated trauma center. And the third is prohibitive cost and time to cannulation. And that reflects expertise more than it reflects limitations. It's similar to the arguments against Reboa in the trauma setting. I might actually do another episode on Reboa. When you look at trauma-associated respiratory failure, this is the classical indication for trauma, uh, ECMO. And one of the first trials started actually in the 1970s, along with uh, the um, first trials on, on extracorporeal oxygenation in general. And w when you look at extracorporeal oxygenation, one of the first generation was the Bramson lung, that huge cylinder that you see right there. And what that was, was it was basically a percolator, just like the one that you would use for coffee, but it percolated blood in a manner that allowed oxygen to get into it. And they did that by varying the pressures across a membrane, hence why it was called extracorporeal membrane oxy oxygenation. And at the time, we didn't really have lung contusions per se. We used to call it shock lung. And I would argue that, that part of the problem with lung contusions is a distributive component secondary to large amounts of paracrine and autocrine responses, physiologically. I'd argue that based on animal models. I haven't been able to demonstrate it on humans or read about it. If you know a good link, let me know. By 1995, we were starting to see case series. Now, granted, there were 15 to 16 patients, but this was the 90s, and uh, the time to circuit setup was about 15 minutes. And in most cases, there was at least heparin pumped in the circuit. And even in those cases, there was some hope. Um, by the 2000s, we were seeing uh, 80 patient series. And it took a while to collect, but they were there. And eventually, we were starting to see big data from the National Trauma Data Bank and data sources like that, which is probably going to be the future. We're all probably going to have to pool our data to get any meaningful evidence. Um, simply because of the fact that the bigger the numbers, the better it is. And with the evolution of AI, uh, this is probably going to be inevitable, right? Even with relatively high ISS scores, 25, it's not the lowest score, you had 64% survival. But remember, these are mainly primary lung problems up till that point. Um, again, we also had a case match series 
which is something that we tend to do a lot in trauma, uh, as well as ICU, mainly because of the fact that it gives us a better idea of the what-if scenario. And um, by that I mean, well, they all lived because you picked out the right patients, or they all died because you picked out the right patients. You score match them based on a propensity score, and that gives you a better idea. And even in those cases, uh, the survival rates were pretty much more or less equal. The key thing here, though, is although you had excellent survival rates, about 60 to 80 percent, depending on which series you read, as is demonstrated here, the key point is that in many of these cases, these were late ECMO cannulations. These weren't acute. These were patients who were on a ventilator with a lung contusion after a couple of days. And so, for the most part, you'd have to take that into context. This isn't acute extracorporeal life support so much as the use of extracorporeal life support to treat a lung contusion. And that context needs to be very apparent. Uh, German data had mimicked that, 52 patients over 10 years. And in Germany, what's very interesting is that they, they actually managed to get people with good cardiac outputs uh, to pump their own blood so that you, you didn't actually, you could use an oxygenator on its own. Uh, and they had sort of mixed results with that. But w what's very interesting is that VV ECMO, as it phased in, had a higher rates of survival overall in that study. And I've referenced it for you because I think it's quite an interesting study. Uh, you know, you could consider it a poor man's ECMO, but the reality of the situation is their survivals were up to 85%, right? Uh, survival to discharge, 81%. So these are extremely good numbers for ECMO patients, especially when you consider that this was a study that was done uh, around uh, 2013, seven years ago, right? This was before we had the port of the more... Uh, accessible machines where the cost prohibitive nature was a lot higher uh, the burden of expertise was a lot higher uh, finding good courses was extremely difficult and yet still and in fact the data was collected in 2008 still they managed to produce an 80 percent survival in germany which is commendable you know uh, similarly we had similar reports by yuan et al uh, cordell smith michaels and chuktai um, all of them showing extremely good results across the board from 2001 till 2010. All of them showing that if your patients survive the initial trauma and are in the ICU with a lung problem, they're going to do better with ECMO. And that's probably due to the lung rest strategies, etc. Less barotrauma, less pneumotrauma, uh, less oxygen-based uh, hyperoxygenation type of traumas and free radical formations at a cellular level. Less burden of stress on the patient overall especially burden on the cardio cardiorespiratory axis, uh, which some people don't believe in, but I do, because I've seen it in animal models, and so therefore it must be there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know, man. I'm just a surgeon. Uh, and then the next category I'm going to talk about is a category that's a little bit more controversial, I would say. It's patients who come in with a massive trauma and hemodynamic compromise. And the reason why I think it'll work in these patients intuitively is because, number one, you're supporting the heart. So you're augmenting cardiac output. Number two, you're providing a massive cannula to give blood and blood products with. Number three, you're reducing the acidemia ischemia reperfusion time. And number four, you can warm the patient efficiently using an ECMO circuit. So if you think about the triad of death, which is hypothermia, coagulopathy, and acidosis, if you think about that triad, it stands to reason. A machine that can take care of your temperature, your cardiac output, and your oxygenation might be a good idea to use, especially when it comes with a free cannula that's three times as big as your central line, at least, if not bigger, right? You're talking about chest tubes and veins here. So it's, it's, it's a real, it, it really stands to reason that these patients would do better. And in fact... They do, right? They do. And I'll, I'll prove it to you in a sec using uh, data from the literature. But, but they do. And, and they work better and they, they, they treat the patients better and more efficiently in a particular patient group. In, a, in other patient groups, remember, this is a machine that has a 55% complication rate, right? 55% of patients on ECMO for trauma and other reasons may have a complication. 
It's been reported as high as that in the literature. But if you look at the pure context of how the machine works and how patients die once they get to the hospital, patients die because of the lethal triad or a brain injury, by and large. If you're talking about the lethal triad, it's acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy. If you have a machine that can pump as much blood as you need, because you're putting a chest tube in a vein, and at the risk of repeating myself, can produce its own cardiac output, and can oxygenate a patient, and as a bonus can warm them, you can even connect a dialysis machine to the circuit, right? What do you have to lose in such cases, where you have a patient... In agonal, and one could argue, intractable shock, although there's no litmus test for intractable shock, I agree with you, um, that, that it might be a good idea. ECMO also has the bonus of unloading the RV, or the venous side. Now, RV and venous side are the same to me because I'm a surgeon. When I'm wearing my, my physician slash critical care hat, completely different story. So I apologize to all the cardiologists and all the physiologists out there. But what I really mean is it helps to decompress the right side of the cardiac circuit by uh, increasing the venous circuit that you go through. Um, the problem with ECMO is that you're going to end up having a problem with is he bleeding because of the ECMO or is he bleeding because he's bleeding, right? Because of the primary problem in trauma. Now, Magnus Larsen took a look at this. And it's very interesting. Everybody should read his PhD. It's somewhere online. I can't divulge because I think it was uploaded illegally. Uh, Magnus, if you're listening to this, uh, please take me on as your postdoc fellow. If you can, it would be an honor. And he managed to develop a rabbit model to examine this issue. And what's interesting is that he looked at all aspects of it. But in general, putting the patients on the machine warming them up, and these patients are rodents, I agree with you, it's a bit abstract, breaking their femurs and then warming them up, they did better. They did better within an hour. So within an hour, he had a corrected pH, he had a corrected base deficit, and the patient was fixing his own temperature by then. This is phenomenal data, right? The patients were doing better. ECMO is an independent variable in terms of correction of platelet function, a correction of INR, and correction of fibrinogen levels, which stands to reason, right? Because you restored normal homeostasis, and you've done it faster than the body can itself using its own compensatory mechanisms, right? Now, the same thing seems to work when you're talking about microscopic integrity in ischemic reperfusion injuries. So one of the reasons why we don't like ischemic reperfusion injuries or prolonged shocks in the ICU is because we, lo we lose mucosal integrity, we lose kidney function, we're losing kidney cells, and we lose cardiac cells with prolonged shock, be it because of sepsis, because of multifactorial issues, uh, because of hypoxemia, it doesn't matter what the cause is. If we have a prolonged shock, it's not good. But if you put an ECMO machine with shock and you take biopsies later, it seems to be clearly evident that ECMO has a role in controlling mucosal integrity, which means that it reduces the end cellular function of multi, the end cellular damage, sorry, of multi organ failure, right? Um, this is all good stuff. Now, this may not translate clinically, I agree with you, but still. It's something to look at. So now you have two different studies that tell me that if you're in a hemorrhagic shock, putting an ECMO circuit can make patients better. The other thing is the IV access itself. Having a huge IV access makes patients better. Now, what about the risk of bleeding? So, um, in patients where no ECMO is put in the, no heparin, sorry, is put in the patient, but heparin is put into the ECMO circuit, patients did not have an increased risk of bleeding when case matched. And that's out of 375 patients, 30 of which had to be on ECMO, and 18 of which ended up on there, so it's a very small number. But what seems to be the trick here is to heparinize the circuit, but not heparinize the patient. Now, this does have its risks, and it may not translate in real life. But, again, the data seems to suggest less inotropic support, 
Better correction of lactate over hours. Better correction of pH. And in addition to that, no increase in bleeding risk. But bear in mind that Italians use dopamine and dobutamine cocktails. Which in the rest of the world is not the standard of practice. I use the word standard of practice as opposed to standard of care because we don't know what the standard of care is when it comes to vasopressors. You can argue with me. We can have an argument over it. You'll be right. I'll be wrong. I'll be right. You'll be wrong. We'll see. But in general, it, it, we don't really have a good handle on which vasopressors to use, right? Um, in addition to mixing uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and isopaterenol, and in some cases, adding milrinone at the end. So you have to bear in mind that they use a different vasopressor regimen, and so therefore the type of ionotropic support that they use might not protend or translate in your clinical practice depending on your strategies. But in general, the Italian data seems to support less bleeding risk and improved overall outcomes that mirror those that were um, mentioned by Magnus Larsen. They're very blunt, heavy series. All the series are. So most of the cases that have been put on ACLS have either had direct cardiac injury or have had a uh, um, polytrauma. Penetrating injuries in general did not land. Even with named vessel penetrating injuries, I couldn't find anything where they put them on ECMO circuit. So the bleeding risk is just not there. Same thing with the Wu 8 Al paper in the Scandinavian Journal of Trauma 2018. Again, the bleeding risk is no worse and no better. Even when that series included burn patients, uh, orthopedic patients with uh, fat emboli, things like that, we still found the same outcomes. You do not have an increased bleeding risk if you use a heparinized circuit without putting heparin into the patient. Right? Even with brain injuries. And just to summarize all the case series, in almost every case series, whether you were looking at lung pathology or otherwise, you had pretty good survival rates for an ECMO population, with the lowest reported about 58%. So, in conclusion, have I convinced you that ECMO works in these patients or not? I, I would hope yes, but, you know, I agree with you. There's still some, some grain of salt there, but... It's very important to emphasize, there is enough data to support the decision to put a trauma patient on ECMO. There is enough data that the bleeding risk is overestimated outside of the literature. In settings where you already have an ECMO service that can be deployed to actively cannulate a patient and take them to the OR for a surgical exploration, there is a role for ECMO from the emergency room. In places where the ECMO team has to be activated from home and the time to cannulation could take hours, even if it's just one hour, it may not be a prudent resuscitative strategy and should be something to be considered once the patient is in the ICU. One would make that argument or could make that argument. So in my mind, ECMO is the way to go uh, with no heparin. I think that I made that very clear. And I think that there's more evidence to come. I'd like to thank Dr. Bracco uh, because he taught me everything that I know about ECMO. I'm one of those guys in the picture. I'm the one with no hair. And I agree with you. Voice for TV and face for radio, Lord help me. But I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'd like to thank David Bracco for A, giving me most of the slides in this presentation. And B, teaching me practically everything I know about ECMO. Have a good day, everyone, and let me know your comments, and please subscribe.